This video is brought to you by Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering amazing boxes of top shelf goods from under the radar brands. Every month, Bespoke Post introduces its members to cool new products, outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing, and more even live oysters, and it's all based on a preference quiz that you fill out. It's free to join and you can skip a month anytime. The first box that I got this month was called Copper, uh, obviously because it contains two copper cups, but that isn't all. What are you gonna put in these copper cups? Yes, it's gonna be a Moscow Mule. And for that Moscow Mule, you're gonna need some ice. So what you do is you pack the ice into this canvas bag, you smash it all up with a mallet, all of this provided in the box, by the way, so that you've got crushed ice for your drink. The canvas absorbs the extra water so it doesn't water it down. Amazing. And of course, you're gonna need some ginger syrup. That is also provided fiery ginger syrup, by the way. Every box has about $70 in retail value, but costs only $45. Now, the second box they sent to me is actually one that I used in my kitchen at home. There will be some B-roll of me using the cleaver from the carnival box right now. I used it, as you can see, to cut up a chicken and then also provided with some spices, which I put on top, and those were amazing. You can preview every box before it ships and decide if you want to keep it, swap it, or skip the month for no charge. Bespoke's box lineup is also constantly changing, and it's great for you, but it also can be a fantastic gift too. Right now, you guys can get 20% off your first box by going going to bspk.me forward slash megaprojects20 or just click the link below and enter megaprojects20 at checkout. And now, let's continue with today's video. With the recent conclusion of the Tokyo Olympics and the world looking more or less towards the Beijing Winter Olympics next year, it's probably time to take a dive into the world of sports. When one thinks of the word sport, the thought that probably comes to mind is something physically demanding in the sense of running, lifting, jumping, etc. But the word sport can today include anything from chess to shooting to even video games, the least physical sport on the planet unless you count things like Dance Dance Revolution. There's another category that fits neatly into this group though, motorsports, race cars. There are two well-known major competitions in the world of auto racing, America's NASCAR and Europe's Formula One. Today we're going to be focusing on the latter and drawing a line from its origins to what is today the fastest motorsport competition in the world. This is the story of Formula One racing. And I largely got this video made because I saw Drive to Survive on Netflix and it was awesome and I just wanted to learn more about Formula One. So here we are. <laughs> If you're not familiar at all with motorsports, it might seem odd to call it a sport. I mean, the car is doing most of the work. And to an extent, you'd be right. But the truth is more complex than that. Motorsport is a physically demanding competition in which athletes, in this case the drivers, are pushed their limits on the racetrack. And it is demanding. Drivers need to exercise for hours a day to ensure that their bodies can handle the stress, not to mention the mental aspect of handling a vehicle at such high speeds. Yeah, in that Drive to Survive TV show, which I'm sure I'm going to bring up again they're doing these neck exercises because when the cars go around the corners otherwise their necks are all too loose so they got to strengthen up their necks it's intense but that is today's motorsports and obviously it wasn't always like this the very first recorded race between motorized vehicles occurred on august the 30th 1867 when two englishmen near the town of manchester held a race with two motorized carriages over a distance of eight miles interestingly enough the reports for this race don't list who was driving the carriages at the time probably because they would have been breaking the law it would also probably explain why the race took place at 4 30 in the morning but i digress apparently this was the first ever Fast and Furious street race. Despite its British and, to a mild extent, American origins, no country would more enthusiastically adopt the concept of auto racing than France. In 1894, the Paris Rouen auto race was held, becoming the first of what we would recognize as an actual competitive auto race. Races before this competition were generally limited by a lack of drivers. In fact, there was one French race in 1887 where the man who won, Georges Bolton, was the only contestant. Congratulations to him, we suppose, but it's rather difficult to 
describe that as a race per se. That wasn't the case with Paris Rouen. There were over a hundred entrants for the competition and 21 drivers who qualified for the main event. It was won on a technicality by Albert Lemaitre, whose three horsepower vehicle averaged a truly blistering pace of 19 kilometers an hour, which in miles per hour is well, very slow. The technicality in question, by the way, was that the actual fastest car needed a second driver as a stoker for its steam engine, which was against the rules. Why do we mention that? Well, because it's time to skip ahead to the 1940s when the hot topic in racing was, well, the rules and regulations. Very exciting stuff, I'm sure, but do bear with us. So. Here's the context. World War I had just ended, and along with that also ended the hiatus on inter-European racing competitions. It turns out that Panzer battalions make racing tournaments difficult to organize. Who would have thought? But with the war's conclusion, the Fédération Internationale de l'Automobile, or FIA, I'm going to call it that from now on because my French pronunciation is was ready and rearing to get back on the racetrack. And so, in the year 1946, the group laid down new rules and regulations to determine the makeup of future races, mostly with the intention of standardizing the designs of race cars. This new international formula would be what gave the competition its name, Formula One. Correspondingly, there is also the lesser known Formula 2 and Formula 3 racing series, also run by the FIA and differently named for having different sets of rules. This naming convention also applies to other competitors in the same vein, including the so called Formula Libre races, which are basically free for alls in terms of car types. Now, with all of that explanation, you're probably wondering what exactly these rules and regulations were. And, well, so are we. See, it's surprisingly difficult to find any sources on what this new internet national formula actually formalized. From what we've gathered, the regulations mostly had to do with technical specifications such as the weight of the car and the capacity of the engine. But in terms of actual details, the first Formula One, well, the formula's just not on the internet as far as we can tell. So the answer to the question, what exactly was the original Formula One, is basically, well, who knows? You're not always getting the answers here on mega projects, apparently. One thing that was certainly not a part of these new rules was anything to do with safety. Whee. Whee. By this point, race cars had gone from averaging a few horsepower to a few hundred horsepower, and obviously faster cars are more likely to kill you. No one's dying in a 19 kilometer an hour race crash. Well, they, they probably totally did, because you could just fall off bad and injure yourself, right? Add in the fact that these first races went on for far longer than races today, causing more driver fatigue, and that racetracks themselves were not well maintained, and the result is that early Formula One races were shockingly dangerous, where it wasn't uncommon for crashes to result in the deaths of the drivers. To give you an idea of just how far safety in motorsports has come, crash helmets were not mandatory until 1952, seatbelts not until 1972. Now, if you're still not shocked, before crash suits and overalls were made mandatory, drivers generally preferred wearing short sleeve shirts to keep themselves cool while racing. Smart until, of course, they're sliding across the pavement following a crash, which is something I think about any time I see anyone riding a motorcycle in a t-shirt. And crashes were common. In the first decades of Formula One, multiple drivers would die in accidents on the track every single year. It's a sobering list. 1952, two fatalities. 1953, three fatalities. 1955, five fatalities. And the list goes on until the mid-1960s, when the FIA finally decided that drivers needed protection and included safety features in the rules. It was just generally accepted back then that when you stepped into the car, there was a solid chance that you weren't going to get out of it. But drivers weren't the only ones at risk. Spectators were often sat right next to the track with nothing between them and the cars going hundreds of kilometers an hour. If something went wrong, they weren't any safer than the drivers. The most notorious accident in this regard was the 1955 Le Mans disaster, where a crash on the track catapulted one of the race cars going over 200 kilometers an hour, that's 120 miles per hour at the time, into a crowd of spectators. In total, 84 people were killed, including the driver. The disaster was so horrific that the car manufacturer Mercedes-Benz, whose driver was the one killed, withdrew from all motorsport competition for over 30 years. Safety would be hammered out over time. Today, crashes, injuries, and deaths still occur, but not nearly at the same rate as in early races. In addition, there would never be another track disaster as serious as Le Mans. Yet this event does lead us into another aspect of F1 racing, something that is today inseparable from the competition itself. 
the design companies. Sports and businesses have been closely linked since the Industrial Revolution, and motorsport is no exception. From the very beginning, racing was seen by car manufacturers as a fantastic way to advertise their brands. The very first races held in France were sponsored by French automobile companies. So when the FIA codified Formula One, big name businesses were all in. Some of the names are ones you probably recognize. Ferrari, Jaguar, Mercedes, Aston Martin, and more besides. There are also some oddballs in the sport. McLaren, for example, worked backwards. They started out as a Formula One racing team founded by New Zealander Bruce McLaren, and only later transitioned into manufacturing luxury sports cars. These companies set aside special divisions, specifically for designing the best race cars that they could compete with, the expectation being that a victory in Formula One would pay dividends for the rest of the business. This is the other side of the coin that is motorsports, where races test not only the skills of the drivers, but the engineers designing their cars to the point where the cars being driven are just as, if not more famous, than the person driving them. Take for example the Alfa Romeo 158-9. This Italian designed car is one of the most successful race cars ever made. Out of the 54 Grand Prix races that it entered, it won 47 of them. Despite this impressive track record, the Alfetta, as it was known, was not actually the most powerful car of its time. The Mercedes-Benz W125, another exceptional model, exceeded it in raw power by a wide margin. While the Alfetta could push anywhere from 200 to 420 horsepower from its engine, the W125 could reach upwards of 600 horsepower. But the rules at the time dictated that in an F1 race, a race car could not exceed 750 kilograms in weight, which the W125 did, and the Alfetta did not. The FIA had also backed itself into a corner by publicly stating that they wouldn't update the rules until 1954, and so nobody bothered to design a new car since it would only be viable for about three years until the rules changed and they'd have to design a car all over again. Even in motorsports, teams played the rules as well as the game. This left the Alfetta in the position of being the best car, with no one willing to invest in beating it, and so the car won almost every competition it took part in until updates the rules and improved engineering by other teams ended its streak. And this is essentially how Formula One has evolved ever since. Engineering superior cars often results in some innovative solutions in order to squeeze every last advantage out of the design. This involved and still involves everything from using light, exotic materials such as magnesium in production to moving the parts around the car chassis, like for example literally putting the extremely dangerous fuel tanks underneath the driver seats to save space. and. Well, they obviously don't do that anymore. The design aspect of Formula One made its biggest difference in the 1990s. During this decade, the technology behind the race cars advanced more quickly than it had in the previous four. Because cutting-edge technology is by definition expensive, only the teams backed by large manufacturers could afford to keep up. Prior to this development, Formula One had a healthy mix of manufacturing teams and so-called privateers entrance into the events that were not directly supported by automobile manufacturers. However, the massive amounts of cash that these manufacturers started started pouring into their cars, resulted in these independent teams being unable to compete, and dozens of them were forced to withdraw from Formula One. Manufacturers dominated for years, until 2008 when the Great Recession happened. Suddenly, manufacturers were out of cash too, and all but the most iconic started withdrawing. Faced with the prospect of not having many races in their Formula One teams, the FIA hastily accepted a few new privateer teams. Some of these included Lotus F1, which took its name from an earlier non-privateer team, rather defeating the point. There was also Hispania Racing, based out of, you guessed it, Spain, and Virgin Racing, founded by Richard Branson, creator of the airline Virgin Airways and the space line Virgin Galactic. At least, the branding's consistent when it comes to Mr. Branson. These teams would eventually be displaced as the recession abated and companies returned, and big manufacturers like Mercedes would go on to dominate the competition. They've indeed won every year since 2014. Yet privateering has left an indelible mark on Formula One, kickstarting the careers of superstars like Michael Schumacher and the well-known Williams F1 team, technically still a private Kia. With all that being said, we've left out the other half of auto racing. A car, of course, is only as good as the person driving it, and there are some truly legendary drivers in the history of Formula One, so let's talk about them next.
Comparing drivers across the decades of Formula One competitions is not easy, especially since not only the cars but the rules have changed over that same period. Indeed, even the number of races held has gone up and down, making raw stats basically useless for comparisons. With that being said, we can point out a few superstars though. In the first 10 years of F1, an Argentine driver gained fame for not only the power of his vehicles but for his skill in handling them. Juan Manuel Fangio is today considered one of, if not the best Formula One driver in the history of the sport. He spent 10 years racing in Formula One from 1948 to 1958 and won a full five championship titles, a record that would remain unbroken until 2003. What truly sets him apart from other drivers, however, is that he won these championships with four separate teams – Alfa Romeo, Ferrari, Mercedes-Benz, and Maserati. The difference in quality between their respective cars was significant, yet Fangio won championships with them anyway, and that particular feat has not been repeated by any driver since. He was also briefly kidnapped by Fidel Castro before a race in Havana, Cuba, because his life wasn't interesting enough, apparently. Of course, only so many legends can fit on a racetrack, and as F1 developed as a sport, some truly legendary rivalries emerged. For example, the Brazilian Nelson Piquet and the Briton Nigel Mansell were objectively driving the best cars on the track in the 1986 Grand Prix. However, even though they were on the same team, they kept depriving each other of points, causing the Frenchman Alain Prost to secure a narrow win for the championship. Prost himself had a bone to pick with Art and Senna, also a Brazilian, which led to a nasty spat in 1989 when Senna accused the French president of FIA of favoring Prost in a dispute over a race that year. In the more modern age of F1, i.e. after the 1990s, statisticians have argued that the impact of drivers has fallen in comparison to the impact of cars, which may be part of the reason that Fangio's four-team record stands unbeaten. However, there are still some high-profile star players, such as the German Michael Schumacher, who is credited with single-handedly popularizing F1 in Germany. Countries like to root for their own, of course, but when he retired in 2006, three of the top 10 F1 drivers that year were of German nationality, up from zero when he first entered the sport in 1991. Schumacher was also the man who broke Fangio's title record in 2003, and by 2013, his final career tally stood at seven championship titles and 93 total F1 victories. By contrast, the most any other active racer at the time had was 32. It seemed an unbeatable record at the time, but in 2001, when Schumacher was in his prime, he gave an interview where he spoke about a 16-year-old go-karting sensation in Britain and tipped him for future success in Formula One. He's a quality driver, Schumacher said, very strong and only 16. If he keeps this up, I'm sure he will reach F1. That quality driver he was speaking of was a young man by the name of Lewis Hamilton, and Schumacher turned out to be absolutely right. Hamilton would go on to enter Formula One and would win his first championship in 2008 on the last lap of the last race of the season. At this point, Hamilton has broken Schumacher's record for most wins with a current tally of 100, always getting updated, in fact the script here says 99, <laughs> and has equaled Schumacher's title record of seven championship wins. Now, we won't call him the best because of the reasons stated earlier, but we can certainly call him the best right now, and he shows no signs of slowing down. And neither, for that matter, does Formula One itself. The current trajectory of F1 is twofold. First, the sport itself has grown in popularity and now sees tournaments held all over the world from Europe to the Middle East to Asia. Second, the FIA is diversifying outwards into other Formula races, including the relatively recent Formula E for electric vehicles. At the moment, its popularity lags behind F1 proper due to the limitations of electric vehicles compared to gas-powered ones, but given that electric vehicles are improving all the time, it may be sooner rather than later that this gap begins to close. Then, of course, there's the United States. America has its own giant high-speed motorsports market, which, as we've established, is currently filled with NASCAR. Yet, even here, Formula One is making headway. Specifically, the release of the Netflix documentary series Drive to Survive, according to Australian racer Daniel Ricciardo, helped put F1 on the map in the US, essentially doubling its fan base in the country. This is despite the fact that for the first season of the show, the most competitive teams, Ferrari and Mercedes, refused to participate due to wanting to keep their car designs as close to the chest as possible. But after the good response the show received, the companies joined in, and the show has even managed the rare feat of becoming more popular as time goes on. As it stands, however, F1 is unquestionably one of Europe's most successful sport leagues, and it looks poised to grow even more than it already has, especially since it's now owned by an American company. Looks like we just can't keep any nice things to ourselves. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do click that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.